that if our goal is to end up with a saturated carbon chain, we have to reduce the oxidation level of the ketone carbon to a CH2 group. Note that this is reduction, the replacement of two carbon oxygen bonds with two carbon hydrogen bonds. In the laboratory, we could do this a few different ways. Um, one approach might involve, for example, the Wolf-Kishner reduction, in which we use hydrazine, H2N, NH2, and base, KOH, to make this happen. There are also multi-step approaches. So for example, we could use something like sodium borohydride to first reduce the ketone to an alcohol, hopefully not touching the thioester, and then eliminate water from the resulting beta hydroxy compound using something like aqueous H2SO4 and heat. This would give an alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl, and then using something like hydrogenation conditions, H2 and a metal catalyst, to convert the alkene into an alkane. This last approach is most analogous to the way nature does it, although nature doesn't make use of these very strong reducing agents in very strongly acidic conditions. In the biosynthetic pathway, the source of hydride is nature's source of hydride, NADPH or NADH. Keep in mind that this is nature's equivalent of H minus. Hydride from NADPH adds to the carbonyl carbon and a proton adds to the carbonyl oxygen to give this beta hydroxy thioester. And notice that this stereocenter is formed as a single enantiomer in the biochemical context because the enzyme is a chiral catalyst. This reaction, by the way, is catalyzed by the enzyme 3 ketoacyl ACP reductase. Notice that if we number the carbons, 1, 2, 3, this is a 3 ketoacyl ACP, and the reductase enzyme catalyzes the reduction of carbon 3 from a ketone to an alcohol. The next enzyme, 3 hydroxyacyl ACP dehydratase, dehydrates this intermediate, in other words, eliminates water from it to form an alkene. And finally, the third enzyme, enoyl ACP reductase, reduces the alkene to an alkane through the use, again, of NADPH and H+. Notice now that we've elongated the chain of acetyl-CoA from two carbons to four carbons by introducing another two-carbon unit, another molecule of acetyl-CoA, and the carbon-carbon bond that remains in this elongated chain, the newly formed carbon-carbon bond, is this one, and it was made through a Claisen-type reaction between the enolate, or enol, as the case may be, of acetyl-CoA and an electrophilic acetyl-CoA molecule. Now that we've done this elongation once, of course, we can repeat with this guy as the electrophile for the next round. At this point, another molecule of malonyl-CoA can enter the picture. Remember, malonyl-CoA had this carboxylate group at the beta position relative to the thioester group, and running these molecules through the same sequence will introduce another two-carbon unit into the chain. And this can repeat again and again and again until the desired chain length is reached. This figure shows, the, shows you the overall process, starting from the malonyl ACP undergoing condensation with the acyl ACP. This condensation really can be accurately called a Claisen condensation. This gives the three keto acyl ACP, that's a typo, this should say acyl, and this is reduced, eliminated, and reduced again to give the elongated acyl ACP, and the cycle can then repeat. And one point that I'll bring up now that we'll see again and again throughout the semester is that the nature of this biosynthetic pathway is really dictated by fundamental principles of organic chemistry. Fatty acids just can't be synthesized any old way in biochemical contexts, and it's issues of the stability of the intermediates involved, the activation energies associated with different types of mechanistic steps, and things like this that really dictate the structure of biosynthetic pathways. This is an important lesson of this course. For example, in this context, we might ask the question, why can't we just deprotonate acetyl-CoA directly to make it the nucleophile? Why is decarboxylation needed? So the enolate, of course, looks unstable, from a biochemical perspective, and this looks like an intermediate we should avoid, but what about the enol? Why can't this just be generated directly from acetyl-CoA? One of the problems with this is the relatively low acidity of the alpha carbons of thioesters and esters. Removing a proton from the alpha carbon 
of a thioester is actually relatively difficult. But what's special about CO2? Why is the elimination of CO2 something that drives this process forward? One very simple way to think about it is that when CO2 is removed rather than H+, we're eliminating a gas, and that gas is eliminated irreversibly since CO2 leaves the enzyme and in fact leaves the cell entirely. So we can generate the enol very straightforwardly from the malonyl CoA through an irreversible elimination of CO2 as opposed to a deprotonation that's going to be very difficult to accomplish with a biochemical base. This irreversible elimination of CO2 provides a huge driving force for the formation of this enol. And it's this fundamental idea that we're eliminating a gas, and entropically that's great, that helps explain why malonyl-CoA is used as the nucleophilic partner in the biosynthesis of fatty acids rather than acetyl-CoA directly.